we're going to talk about what is a bond. Hopefully you guys learned this in FIM 38600, but most likely not, so here we go. A bond is an interest-only loan. And so you've basically got three kinds of loans. You have an amortized loan, like your car payments or your house payments, where every payment represents a combination of two things. What are they? Principal and interest. Principal and interest, very good. Okay, and then you have these deep discount loans, which are basically that it, everything is at the end. A discount loan says that I'm gonna pay you back the full principal and the full interest at the end of the loan. And the bond is what's called an interest only loan. And it pays interest periodically throughout the life of the bond, but it doesn't pay any of the principal until the very last day of the bond's life, at which point it pays all of the principal. And in case you forgot what principal is, basically that's the money that you borrow. Okay, so how does this work? Borrowers, we also, we, so there, I'm going to give you some different vocabulary here. Borrowers and bond issuers are the same group of people. If you are issuing bonds, you are borrowing money. If you are the first person to sell a bond, then that bond seller is the bond issuer. They are the borrower. And they're gonna sell those bonds to lenders. And we'll call those lenders the buyers of the bonds. We'll refer to them as bond holders. You'll also hear them referred to as creditors. Creditors. I have this idea for a device to uh, try to get money back that we've lent to people. It's called the creditor drone. <laughs> you guys heard of the creditor drone? So the creditor drone follows you around and says, pay your bills. Yeah, that's not funny at all, is it? Okay. Um, so, we also call them creditors, these, um, oh, yeah, okay, so then, here's, how does this work? The borrowers pay interest periodically throughout the life of the bond. Now, we say periodically because not every bond has the same period for the interest. Sometimes it's annual, sometimes it's semi-annual, and on rare occasions you'll see others, but those are the two big ones. And then they pay all the remaining principal and interest at the end of the bond's life. So there's going to be one last coupon, and then the bond principal will all get paid back at that very last day. Any questions? Okay, so let's cover some vocabulary here. First of all, I want to talk about coupons. Has anyone here ever had experience with coupons? So, tell me about the kind of coupons you're used to. I mean, the ones I'm used to is like getting a discount on food or something. Yeah, you're getting a discount on food. And so, uh, when I was a kid, it was the 70s, tough times, mom would cut coupons out of the newspaper. Oh, and, or the little machines in the store. Okay, they didn't have those in the 70s. Back to the story, <laughs> you could take the coupons in and get something for them. You'd say you're redeeming the coupon. Okay, so apparently coupon is French for a little piece of paper cut from a bigger piece of paper. And the way it works on bonds, and I've got a picture here for you, is that we have, um, there's the bond itself up here at the top, and then down here are these coupons. And basically, in order to get your interest payment, what you would do is clip the coupon and take it to, in this case, the state of Texas or the bank representing the state of Texas or your broker, and of course they're going to charge you a fee, and get your interest on the bond. And so you had to have these coupons in order to get that. That's why we still call these payments today, even though there are no longer for most bonds, those little paper coupons, most of them are electronic, but we still call the interest payments coupons. So don't let that freak you out. We're calling it something that hasn't existed for a long time for the most part. Okay, so those coupons can get paid semi-annually or annually, and we'll discuss um, how we know. Then there is the face or par value of the bond. We use these terms interchangeably, the face or par value of the bond. And that's going to be the amount of money, that's the principal that you receive at the end of the bond's life. That's the principal that you receive at the end 
of the bond's life. So face value, par value are the same thing. And then we have what's called the coupon rate. The coupon rate, and you want to be sure to write this one down, it is the percentage that we multiply by the face value to determine the annual amount of coupons paid. It's the percentage we multiply by the face value to determine the amount of annual coupons paid. And I want you to underline that word annual twice. I want you to underline the word annual twice. It's the percentage that we multiply by the face value to get the amount of annual coupon paid. And you're going to see why that becomes important later on. And then we have maturity. This is the amount of time until we receive that face value. It's the amount of time that we were, uh, until we receive the face value. So if a bond gets issued, a 30-year bond, that maturity is 30 years, you're going to have to wait 30 years to get that face value. Now, as the bond gets older, 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 that time to maturity, of course, goes down. For every year goes by, it goes down another year. And then we have the price. And this is where people start to freak out. They get the price and the face value confused. The price is the amount that the bond is selling for in the market. The price is the amount that the bond is selling for in the market. And on occasion, on very, very rare occasions, you will see bonds selling for face or par value, and I'll explain how that happens. But for the most part, this price is going to be something different. Oh, and by the way, the default face value or par value for a bond is $1,000. The default, no, sorry, not default. <laughs> <laughs> default face value or par value for a bond is $1,000. If I don't give you a face or par value, then that is what you assume. You assume it's $1,000. And then we have the yield to maturity. The yield to maturity. Two things I want you to know about the yield to maturity. Number one, it is the rate that the market is, is demanding right now on these bonds. So there's a required rate of return. It's based on the, what do you think the required rate of return is based on? It starts with an R. Oh, come on. Yeah, it's the risk. Mr. Sedai, you really do look better with the hair down. You really do. So please, please compliment Mr. Sedai so he'll feel confident in his new hairstyle. Okay, back to the story. <laughs> back to the story. Yield to maturity. What's that? He's going to have to get a haircut now. Yeah. I think See? it's just jealous of your hair. <laughs> hey, you know, so you can see where mine's starting to come out. Yeah, it's trying to disappear. Enjoy it while, <laughs> enjoy it while you can, Mr. Sedai. You're, you're absolutely right. I wish I had hair like that. Back to the story. And it's so shiny. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yield to maturity. We said that it's the required rate of return. Now, the other thing you need to know about yield to maturity is it is an APR, annual percentage rate. And hopefully you remember from your studies for exam one that an APR is the subperiod rate times the number of subperiods in the year. It's the subperiod rate times the number of subperiods in the year. Now, for an annual bond, they're going to be the same thing. This uh, subperiod rate is the whole year, right? And there's only one period per year. But when we start doing semi-annual, we will see that the yield to maturity is actually twice the subperiod rate. And so we're going to have to make adjustments for that in our calculations. Two things up here change with actions of the market. Price and yield to maturity. Price and yield to maturity. And remember, the price or value of anything is the present value of the future cash flows divided by the earth. Yeah, discounted at a rate appropriate to the risk. So each one of those coupons is a future value. The face value is a future value. 
when we do this, we can see that if R goes up, what happens to present value? It goes down. And so as rates climb, bond prices drop. What's going on with interest rates right now? They're going up. What do you think is happening with bond prices right now? Got to be, they're going down. And by the way, you will, it's so funny, um, in the Wall Street Journal when you read about bonds, they always have to throw this line in. Price, bond prices move inversely with yields to maturity. Now, for those of you that have been in this class now, you know that's exact, that, that always has to be true, but they have to put that in there for people who haven't been educated like you, right? And so here we go. I'm going to demonstrate this visually so you can remember. As yield to maturity goes up, prices go down. As yield to maturity goes down, prices go up. Questions? Okay, now there's only other, one other thing up here that typically changes over the life of the bond, and that's maturity. But maturity goes down at a predictable rate, right? One year for every year that passes. So what's a bond worth? We just got through saying that it's the uh, sum of the present values of the expected future cash flows, and so we need to figure out what those future cash flows are. And it turns out they are the coupons and that one face value. And we can actually look at those and think of the coupons as an annuity. An annuity is a set of identical payments that go on for a finite number of periods. So that fits coupons really well. And then there's the face value, and we can treat it like a future value because it is a single cash flow. And so all I have to do is calculate the present value of those coupons and the present value of the face value, add them together, and that gives me my bond price. Now, when we discount things to get a present value, we always have to have a required return. And that is where, oh, I didn't write it up here, yield to maturity comes in. You see it's, a, it's the present value of its cash flows discounted at the yield to maturity. Questions? Okay. So let's do a bond pricing example here. A bond with a face value of 1,000. By the way, did I need to tell you 1,000? Yeah, we could have assumed that because unless I tell you otherwise, you are required to assume that, right? And in fact, that Texas bond I just got through showing you with the coupons, that thing's older than dirt. But it still had a face value of a thousand bucks. So this is like a pretty standard thing. A coupon rate of 6%. A coupon rate of 6%. Can someone tell me what is the annual amount of coupon that this bond pays? What's the annual amount of coupon that this bond pays? Yeah, 60. So here's the way you can think about this. 6% divided by 100% multiplied by $1,000. What happens? The percents cancel out. These zeros cancel out. So basically, as long as the face value is 1000 all I have to do is take the number of the coupon rate and multiply it by 10. And that's how I get this $60. Now keep in mind that's the annual amount paid. Now they're telling us that interest is paid annually. Can you tell me what is the amount then of, the annu of, of each coupon that gets paid? This isn't hard. It's just 60, right? It's just 60 because we've already figured out the annual amount of coupon that gets paid is 60. Each coupon is paid once per year. Therefore, all of that 60 rests in that one coupon. Now, they tell us that the market requires a 6% return on this bond. Of those vocabulary terms that we talked about, which one is this? I'll give you a hint. It was three letters. Yeah, YTM yield and maturity, that's the required rate on the bond. Now, by the way, if I tell you 6%, it's 6% per year. year. We always assume that interest rates are annual unless we are told otherwise. 
Okay, so now we are ready to calculate the market price of the bond, and we said that that market price is just going to be the present value of the coupons added to the present value of the face value. And the cool thing is that your calculator can do this all at the same time. First thing I want you to do is hit the yellow button second and hit future value. What does it say about future value? Clear TVM, the easiest way to mess yourself up on bond pricing problems is to not clear out your uh, TVM. Okay, now uh, we're going to start looking for what we need to plug in here. What do you think I should put in for N? 10. We've got 10 years here. And uh, yield maturity, 6%. What should I do with that? Yeah, 6, I over Y. And then I've got this coupon of 60. What am I going to do with that? Payment. Payment. And then I've got the face value of 1,000. What do I do with that? Future value. Yeah, compute, or not compute, so future value. There we go. Whew. Okay, so if it helps you to think about it, you can think of face value, future value, they're both F, V, if that helps you to remember. Okay, now I've got everything in there. How, and what am I going to hit next? Two buttons. What am I going to hit in order to calculate the price of this bond? Compute. And which one? Present value. Yeah, present value. And it says minus 1,000. And I want you to notice a couple of things. The first thing is, it's minus. That is the calculator sign convention. Cash flows in opposite directions have opposite signs. And so you can think about it this way. I'm paying this much money for the bond up front. In return, I will receive the coupons and I will receive the face value. Does that make sense? Okay, so write this down. The coupons and the face value will always have the same sign. The coupons and the face value will always have the same sign. The present value or price will always have the opposite sign. The present value or price will always have the opposite sign. Okay, now that's the first weird thing that I wanted to point out here. The second weird thing is that this bond is selling for precisely $1,000. $1,000 happens to be the face value of this bond, but that is not why we say the price of the bond is $1,000. The reason the price of this bond is 1000 is because the coupon rate is exactly equal to the yield to maturity. The coupon rate is exactly equal to the yield to maturity. Now why is that the case? It's because the coupons are exactly enough to satisfy investors' required return. The coupons are exactly enough to satisfy the investor's required returns. If the coupons were not enough, then they would demand uh, to only buy this bond at a discount. And if the coupons were extra luxurious, then we would see people be willing to pay a premium for the bond. But we'll get that to that in a minute. Now this kind of bond has a special name. We call it a par bond. We call it a par bond. Any idea why we call it a par bond? Yeah, it's selling at par value. Now, you may say, aha, earlier he said par value, face value, interchangeable. Therefore, certainly we could call this a face bond. Wrong. If you go around calling this a face bond, all your finance friends will know that you're, a, you're an idiot. So don't do that. It's a par bond. So. Here's something that might be helpful to you. On an exam, when it says a par bond has a coupon rate of 6%, what's the yield of maturity? 6%. Yeah, 6%. You immediately, as soon as you see par bond, you're like, ha, I know some things, right? Okay, any questions so far? Okay, let's go on to the next one. A bond with a face value of 1,000, didn't have to tell you that, Coupon rate of 6%, 10 years to maturity. Has anything changed yet? Oh, uh, I, I said yes. So we're, we're getting there. The market requires a 7% return on this bond. What do we call that? 
Yeah, that's the yield and maturity. That's the required return. Now, I want you to notice that the market is requiring more return than the coupons are offering. That means I am only going to buy this bond if I can get it at a discount. And so we're going to see that that's what happens. So it's asking, what's the market price of the bond? And we go back to our calculators. I'm going to say clear, second clear TVM. I'm going to put in 10 for N, it's still 10 years. I'm going to put in, what, what do I put in for I for Y? Seven. Seven. And then uh, what do I put in for payment? 60. And what do I put in for future value? 1,000. And then what do I compute? Compute the present value. I'm getting $929.76. Why is the sign negative? That's just the sign convention, right? It's cash flows in the opposite direction. So we're going to have to pay $929.76 in order to receive those coupons and in order to receive that base value. Now, how come this works out? It turns out that we, you know, we said there's two ways you can get return. There was the the payments on stocks we talked about dividends and on the dividend yield, but there was another kind of yield. What was it? Dividend yield and there's capital gains yield. This is what you get from the price going from the current price to a higher price in the future. And so there is a capital gain here of uh, what, $70.24? Capital gain is $70.24 along with the coupons, gives us that required return that we want, right? Okay, so what likely happened to this bond? The market was requiring 6%, now they're requiring 7%. Two possible things. Number one, rates in general went up by 1%. Or number two, uh, even if the rates didn't change, maybe this company became more risky. Do companies become more risky and less risky over time? Oh, yeah. Um, so I'll give you an example. Have you guys heard what's going on with Credit Suisse? Yeah. Yeah, Credit Suisse may be going bankrupt. And so uh, right now, if you want to uh, buy their bonds, you can get them for pretty cheap. Why? Yeah, there's a good chance you're not going to get your money, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Questions. So when I want to buy this bond for $929, is that what that's saying? Yeah, you would, if you went out to buy this bond right now, you would spend $929.76. Yeah. That thousand dollars isn't going to change over the life of the bond. The $60 coupon isn't going to change over the life of the bond, but the price will. So what really happens here? People bid bonds up and down in the market, so they require additional returns, so they bid the bond down or they uh, figure that the company is safer, so they're requiring less return, so they bid the bond up. Does that make sense? So those two things are always fluctuating in the market. Now we call this a discount bond. Why is it a discount? Because it's selling at a discount to face value. It's selling at a discount to face value. That's why we call it a discount bond. Now, some people look at a discount bond and say, woohoo! That's a great deal. This bond's on sale. I should grab me one of these. Does that sound right, Miss Craven? No. She says no because this bond is returning exactly what the market requires of it based on the risk. Does that make sense? And so a discount bond is not a good deal. It's not a bad deal. It's a fair deal. The only reason I can think of for preferring a discount bond over any other kind of bond is that you don't have $1,000. If I only had $930 to invest, I could still afford this bond, but I could not afford a par bond. Does that make sense? Okay. Now our next one has all the same information except for one thing. What has changed, Mr. Scott? Yield of maturity has gone yeah. down. What would cause the yield of maturity to go down? Uh, base value to go up. Very sorry. <laughs> Swing and a miss. Uh, Mr. Bowrector, what would cause a yield of maturity to go down? 
interest rates going down. Okay, interest rates could have gone down by one percentage. What else could have happened? Yeah, the bond could have become less risky because the borrower became less risky. Does that make sense? So let's say that Credit Suisse's problems all go away next week. What's going to happen? The yield to maturity on their bonds will go down because they are now less risky. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's get our calculators out here. And uh, everything stays the same, so all I'm going to do here is say... Uh, 5i per y, compute present value. Now I'm getting $1,077.22. Is that more or less than the face value? It's more. Very good. It's more. Okay. Now, in this case, we are experiencing a capital loss. By the way, let me tell you a little something about bonds. And, and I'm going to liken it to human beings. When you hold a newborn baby in your arms, there's only one thing for sure you know about this baby's story. Do you know what it is? Say again? What, okay, you know that. But the baby's future, let's say that. You know one thing about the baby's future. What do we know about every baby? It eventually dies. It will eventually die, right? <laughs> Isn't that dark? Why do I tell you such dark things? Well, first of all, I'm evil. But secondly, I want you to always remember this. Every bond is like every person. We all end our lives in the same way. Every bond ends up trading at face value. You're going to receive that last coupon, and like two seconds later, you're going to get the face value. The bond is going to be worth exactly face value because to the two-second power here isn't going to do anything for this. So basically, present value is going to be equal to future value at that point. So all bonds end their lives at face value. If I haven't told you otherwise, you know that's $1,000. So what can you tell me? is going to happen to the price of this bond over its life. It's got to go down, which means will we be getting will we be getting a capital gain? No, we're actually going to suffer a capital loss. Now, why would I be willing to put up with such bad behavior as a capital loss? What's special about this bond that makes me willing to do that? Okay, the coupons are? So over the time that you get paid that you hold that bond will be worth more than what the, um, you get paid more out in coupons than what you'll lose in capital losses. Yeah, so you've got, or you've got this big fat coupon. And that big fat coupon by itself represents a higher rate of return that is necessary for the bond. Therefore, people are willing to bid up the price of this bond to over face value. Sorry, it's allergy season. Over face value, and they are willing to put up with a capital loss because when you look at the combination of that capital loss and those coupons, it gives you exactly the return that's required based on the risk of that bond. Does that make sense? Okay, now, when you uh, think about premium goods, uh, you tend to think of them as being better than other goods. And so you've got a premium handbag, and you carry that around and you make sure everyone can see it. Uh, do we look at premium bonds the same way? No, premium bonds are fairly priced. Premium bonds are fairly priced. Uh, par bonds are fairly priced. Discount bonds are fairly priced. All of these things are fairly priced. I wouldn't prefer to have one over another unless I just didn't have enough money to buy the par or the premium. Okay, any questions? Is there any advantage to buy bonds versus regular bonds? Buy what bonds? I think E-bonds. So these are government bonds. 
U.S. government bonds? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. So I think E-bonds, I'm not sure. Let's look that up. E-bond. Oh, I was thinking about these double E bonds. Oh, our E bonds, the only way to buy double E is to buy them electronic form from Treasury Direct. So, this is debt of the United States government. So, what's the advantage to buying that? It's risk free. But, what does that tell us about the required return on these dogs? I mean, on these. <laughs> low. So, uh, it, so, let's ask who would want to invest in these? old people because they want to basically protect their money. Does that make sense? What about I-bonds? Hmm. I-bonds? I-bonds is like where they match inflation. Yeah, okay. So uh, for people in your state of, of life, uh, do you have like an extra bunch of money laying around that you really need to protect from inflation? No. Um, and in my stage of life, I'm probably not sitting on mountains of cash anyway. So I think there are probably people who would benefit from those, but uh, like retirees for one. But think about this one, you're only allowed to buy $10,000 per person. So you can protect, say, so a household of a, of a man and a woman, or two men, whatever, that are retired, and how much of that household cash can they protect against inflation? Twenty thousand bucks. What if they have kids? What if? Oh, so if the kids are living with them, yeah, okay. right. But we just said that people at that stage of their life do they have a lot of cash laying around? Well, no. I was just saying that kid a parent say I have. Do they still kids. live in your house? Yes. Yeah. If they live in your house, then you can't. But on the other hand, if you've got kids in your house, you probably don't have any money. <laughs> Which is why my wife and I don't have any kids. <laughs> I mean, it's reason number four hundred seventy-two of why we don't have kids. And, and you all are welcome for me not reproducing. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's let's not get off into the, the little nuances of these different bonds. If you want to know about these different kinds of things, Dr. Phil Pot is your man. He is our certified financial planner program head, and he knows the ins and outs, all these little things. He he knows these tiny regulations that I will never never learn. Questions. Okay. I need to check on my bonds. You had to what? You need to check on your bonds? Yeah. Okay. So, questions before we move on? Yeah. Is, uh, I would assume there is no limits to how many bonds we can buy. Yeah, oh yeah. The only, so the, the, the I bond is basically a government program, and that's why it's limited, for the same reason that my contribution to my 401k is limited, because yeah. it's a government program. So I, the difference between the, the rate that I'm getting for coupon and then the yield maturity is, is giving me fairly more, in a way, does time value of money play a role into this? Oh, of course! Remember, we're taking the present value of that annuity of coupons and the present value of the future value, or the face value. And we add those together. That's all time value of money. That, that price is changing because of the time value of money. So let's put it this way. I, yeah, sure. If you were receiving the face value today, would time value of money come into play at all? Face value today. If you were receiving the face value today, would the time value of money come into play at all? It depends on when I put in the money. Right? No, 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 no. If it's, if it's today, no, what's the, no. it's no, right? Because this T is zero, and anything to the zero of power is one, so we're dividing by one, therefore, present value equal future value. But as soon as we get away from that, then we start to see this ability to have premium and discount bonds. Absolutely has to do with time value of money. Yeah. And she said she needs to check on our bonds, and my question is, why? Because you're 30. Because you're 30. No. That's not a good answer well, for I mean, any. Like, they were bought one of the four, so. Oh, okay. Have they matured? I'm assuming. Oh, okay. So well, then, hey, this is <laughs> one good time to look at the bonds, right? Because you need to take that money and do something with it. My mom still has a bond from World War II that her grandfather bought for her. It was a $25 bond. I hope that thing has been accruing interest all these years. And so after she's gone, I'll take a picture of it and then cash it in.
Oh. Just one way to look at it. So if the coupon rate is more than the yield to maturity, it's a premium bond. But if the yield to maturity is more than the coupon rate, it's a discount at 30 equals par. Yes. So would yep. you ask us total uh, capital gain or loss based over the lifetime of the bond? So oh, I could, but it's very easy, right? What's the capital loss on this bond? Oh. Yeah, seventy-seven dollars or so. What was the capital gain on the other one? I forget, but all you do is subtract a thousand, right? Just seventy percent. Yeah, so it was uh, seven. Yeah, so it was nine seventy-six. Nine twenty-five. Nine twenty-nine seventy-six. So it was what thirty dollars and twenty-four cents, something like that. So you were saying though, like, seventy. Even though we're getting a capital loss, it's still worth it to invest in that bond. Absolutely, because those big, fat, juicy coupons. Right. So I was, I was wondering if you were going to ask a question over like how much you would return over the life of the bond. Well, I know how much it's going to return over the life of the bond. What's the yield to maturity? Ten years. So yield to maturity. Oh, five years. Yeah, that's how much it's going to return. Does that make sense? Good question. Other questions? So that means that the return that we might get from those, that we're going to get from the coupons, is going to be positive. It's going to be high. It's the coupon rate, right? But if I looked at the capital gain yield for this thing, it would actually be negative. And when we add those two together, it would be, in this case, what, 5%? Okay. Good questions. Other questions? So thinking to like stocks, I've, I heard someone wants to compare a specific stock to bonds because of the dividends that it produced. Okay, so <laughs> here's the problem. Um, stocks produce dividends, but are, is the company required to pay dividends? No. No. Um, are companies required to pay coupons? Yeah. yeah, and if they don't, then they are in default, and that allows you to take control of the company, right? If the stock stops paying dividends, then you have to worry about, uh, you, you know, th there's nothing you can do, right? The other thing is, what do you think fluctuates more, stock prices or bond prices? Stock. Stock prices. We talked about that. Stockholders are at the very end of the line, right? And so they got the riskiest position, therefore their position fluctuates the most. So even if they're paying continuously the same dividend, uh, you might have capital gain losses each and every year. If they are paying out more money than they're actually bringing in, it kind of makes sense, right? So like you said, bonds are better for people who are more risk averse, like older. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because you're, you've got this, it's guaranteed, and the only time the guarantee doesn't work is if they default on the bond. So it's like our grand, my grandparents bought me bonds when I was born, but they should have bought me stock. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So if you're planning to buy any child a gift for their birth, think back to our chapter 10 discussion. What was the highest returning set of investments that we looked at? Small stocks. Small stocks. So here's what I would do. I would go out and I would buy, let's say you're buying, you could buy one share of the S&P 600 and you give it to little Felix because that's what all kids are named. Actually, that's my father-in-law's dog's name, Felix. And then think about by the time Felix gets old enough to do anything, it's probably going to be some sizable stuff, as opposed to bonds, which you know exactly what they're going to be worth. And by the way, uh, the, the best kinds of bonds to buy for a kid, discount bonds, because you don't want the kids getting the coupons in the meantime and blowing them on comic books or dope. Does that make sense? <laughs> Okay, other questions? Okay, so now we have basically the same thing except for the interest is paid semi-annually. Ladies, what does semi-annually mean? Twice a year. Twice a year. How come ladies may know more about this than men? Semi-annual sales. Semi-annual sales, especially as... <laughs> Evil Victoria's Secret. The evil Victoria's Secret store, right? Well, you know what Victoria's Secret really is? No one over 30 can fit into her crap. But I digress. No one can fit into her crap. She's a fictitious person. Oh, please. She just, she just gives me static all the damn time. Hey, seriously, she's a fictitious person. I know. Yeah, I know. 
right? Like, Les Wexner made up this fake British woman, and at first she rode horses and other stuff, and then they figured out that it would sell better if she was just Fredericks of Hollywood type stuff, right? You guys need to watch that. I, I forget whether it's on Hulu or Netflix uh, about Victoria's Secret, Angels and Demons, and it's a whole story of that. It's worth a watch, even if you're not into ladies' underwear. Okay. Back to, it, it's a marketing story. Okay. Where the hell were we? Oh, the interest is paid semi-annually. Okay. So, remember we said that the coupon rate times the face value tells us the amount of what? Annual coupon paid. Well, if I'm paying twice per year, what do I need to do with that number? I got to divide it by two because when I add those two coupons together, they've got to equal that annual amount. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the first thing we've got to change in our calculation. The second thing we've got to change is N because now we're not talking about the number of years, we're talking about the number of semi-annual periods. Now, in 10 years, how many semi-annual periods are there? 20. So that's the second change we're going to have to make. And the third thing is to remember that an APR, a yield to maturity, is an APR, which is subperiod rate times the number of subperiods in the year. How many subperiods are there in the year here? Two. So I have to divide that APR by two to come up with the subperiod rate, which is the rate for the six months. So in this case, I've got to take that five and divide it by two. So let's see what happens when we do all that. And by the way, remember this number right here. It'll come, it'll be important here in a second. In fact, I'm going to store one. Okay. Now let's say second clear TVM, just for fun. 1,000, future value, what's N? Oh, how many semi-annual periods? 20. Got to remember, 20, the, the periods get doubled. What happens to yield and maturity? What do I do with it? Divide by 2. So we're going to get 2.5 here. Uh, I for Y. And then, um, how much are the payments? 30, because we've got to take 60 divided by 2. And the future value is still 1,000. And so now I'm ready to compute the present value. It looks very similar, but is it identical to what we had before? No. And the reason why is of, because of compounding. This one is actually a little more valuable. Let's see, I'm going to change this to... Yeah. Oh, that is not right. Okay, so you guys saw it. It's like 70 cents. Okay, now why is this bond more valuable? Because of compounding. And how does that work? So with the first bond, you had to wait an entire year to get your first payment. Does that make sense? This one, you only have to wait six months. What could you do with that money after six months? You could reinvest it and you could start earning interest on the interest. Now, of course, the assumption that we make is that you're going to earn the same interest that you're getting on the bond. Might be a good one, might not be. We'll see that later. <coughs> but that's the assumption. And that's why these semi-annual bonds, otherwise identical semi-annual bonds, will always be worth more than the um, annual bond. By the way, what do you think is the most popular kind in the U.S., semi-annual or annual? It's actually semi-annual, so you're going to see a boatload of semi-annuals. So here's something to write down on your sheet. On semi-annual bonds, N is doubled, and I per Y and payment are cut in half. I mean, you could figure that all out from the conversation we just had. But in the heat of battle, will you remember? Probably not. So you want to write that on your note sheet. For semi-annual bonds, N is doubled, and I per Y and payment are cut in half compared to an identical annual coupon bond. OK, so far, the only thing we've done is calculate the present value. And it's been fairly easy, but now we're going to start doing some weird stuff that's going to require us to remember 
about the starting convention. Remember I told you that the bond price or present value has to be one sign and the coupons and the future value have to be the opposite sign. And that's just because of the way the cash flows, the direction of the cash flows. So here we have a bond with a face, by the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna clear TBM. We got a bond with a face value of 1,000, coupon rate of 6%, 10 years, to maturity, interest is paid semi-annually, and then they give us the bond price. And they're gonna ask us, what is the yield to maturity for this bond? Now, what is the first thing I can put in here that we always know that we could just throw right into the calculator? Yeah, the future value. Face value is 1,000, boom, right there. Now, they're telling us the coupon rate is 6%, the face value is 1,000, and it's being paid semi-annually. What's the, the payment amount? Yeah, because we're just gonna take that 60 divided by two. 30 payment. And then the number of years, what should I put in for N? 20. 20. And then I'm going to put 864.1, and I'm gonna hit negative. Why am I doing negative? Cash outflow. Yeah, it's cash outflow. It's a cash flow in the opposite direction of the coupons and the face value. So I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna hit present value. And there's only one thing left for me to compute. I'm gonna compute I per Y. And I'm getting 4%. Is that the yield of maturity for this bond? No, no why not? At semi-annual, semi what do I have to do to be able to get this thing to a YTM? You got to multiply by two. You got to multiply by two. So that tells me that the yield of maturity on this bond is eight. Now, here's something that you can use to check your work. This is a discount bond. We know that it's paying its coupons are less than the yield of maturity. If I get 4% and I see that the coupon rate is 6%, if that were the correct answer, this bond would be a premium bond. And so that might trip you into saying, aha, I remember I have to multiply by two here. Questions? Okay. Now we've got a bond that is got a coupon rate of 6%, interest is paid semi-annually. By the way, I didn't tell you, what's the face value? Oh my, what are you gonna do? It's a thousand, right? The bond yields 7% and is selling for 973.36. How many years until this bond matures? Get your calculator up, we're gonna clear it out. We're gonna say second clear TVM. What's the first thing I put in? Yeah, thousand, face value. Uh, what do I put in for N? Oh, we don't have N, we're gonna calculate it. What do I put in for yield to maturity? 3.5. 3 3.5, we're gonna take that seven and divide by two. Uh, boom. What do I put in for the payment? 30. Payment. And then, uh, what do I, how do I do present value here? I know I'm gonna do 973. 36, what do I have to do? Negative. Negative, and then present value, and what am I gonna compute? N. N. It says 5.999, is that six years? No. No, it is six semi-annual periods. How many years does that give us? Three, do you know what the most common wrong answer is? 12, uh. right? And do you think that would be one of the choices on the exam? Yeah. Absolutely it would be. So that means you actually need to know your stuff. Questions? Okay, a bond is selling for 1,071.70. By the way, this is the most difficult bond calculation I will ever ask you to do. This is the most Difficult bond calculation I'll ever ask you to do. So the bond selling for 1,071.70, it has four years left to maturity. The interest is paid semi-annually. The bond yields 5%. What's the bond's coupon rate? Can anyone tell me whether the coupon rate is going to be less than or more than 5%? Uh, it's going to be less than. So the coupon rate is going to be 
has to be more than the yield of maturity because this thing's selling at a premium. So the coupon rate here is going to be more than the yield of maturity. We're going to find out though what it is. Okay, uh, it's asking what the bond's coupon rate is, so let's get to our calculator here. Clear, second, clear, TVM. First thing I put in is that thousand. That's like the free space on bingo. Everybody gets it right. Now, what is, it says it's got four years left to maturity. What do I do with that? Times two. Times two, so it's eight, and then what? And, very good. Yield of maturity is 5%. What do I do with that? 5 divided by 2, divided by two is 2.5. And where does that go? I over Y. And then, let's see, have we got everything in? Oh no, we need to put in the present value. 1071.7 negative. Mr. Russell, whoa, whoa. Why did we put a negative sign on that one? Yeah, it's the cash flow in the opposite direction, right? Okay, very good. And so now what I'm going to compute is, by the way, which one of these things is impacted by the coupon rate? Is it the face value? Payment. Yeah, it's going to be payment. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute the payment. And I see that it's 35 bucks. Now, we know that basically you take the coupon rate multiplied by 10 to get the annual coupon. And so, is this uh, saying 3.5%? No, why not? You have to multiply by 2 because it's semi-annual. And so, we're going to multiply this payment by 2 gives us 70. Can anyone tell me what the coupon rate is? All you got to do is divide by 10, right? That gives you your coupon rate. Coupon rate is 7%. Is 7% higher than 5%? Yes. Yes. And so that explains why this is a premium bond. Questions? Now, pricing zero coupon bonds. This is a freaky thing. And I didn't know this until I was like second year professor. That when we price zero coupon bonds, unless we're told otherwise, we price them as semi-annual bonds. And so payment is going to be zero regardless. But what's going on in the meantime? Well, we have that compounding effect. And so we're going to price these things as semi-annual. Now, does it make any logical sense to someone just learning about bonds? No. Why do we do it that way? I have a good guess. Bond traders are used to pricing semi-annual bonds. It would confuse the fire out of them if we were to suddenly just throw them annual bonds to price. By the way, do you think bond traders have a PhD in finance? No. Do you think they have uh, an MBA? No. Most likely not. Do you think they have a college degree? Most likely not. Most of the way the pawn traders uh, come up is through the ranks and they may start in the mail room and whatnot. In other words, these people are people who have a very narrow band of knowledge. They're very knowledgeable about that one thing, right? But that one thing is semi-annual coupon bonds. And so that's why I think why we do this. There, I can't think of any other reason that makes any sense for us to do that. Questions? By the way, what do you think the coupon rate is for a zero coupon bond? Zero. Very good. Okay. So, earlier I told you the depressing news about uh, where all people end up eventually. Um, and I told you the news about where all bonds wind up eventually. And so, this is actually quite a good test question. And that is, what uh, what must we expect over the life of a bond? If we buy a discount bond, we expect a capital gain. What must we expect if we buy a premium bond? Over the life of the bond, we must expect a capital loss because all these bonds end up at the same place. Now, I will say this. My little pr picture here is very pretty because I assume that yield maturity stayed the same throughout the life of these bonds. But let me show you what happens if it doesn't. 
they're all going to wind up at exactly the same place. It's just going to be a bumpier ride to get there. That's all that's going to happen. No matter what that yield and maturity does, as long as those bonds do not get defaulted on, they end their lives worth face value. That's it. So, uh, Mr. Taylor, if you buy a premium bond today, can you expect a capital gain or a capital loss? Uh, over time, a loss. Very good. Okay, questions? Now let's talk about the current yield. Put this on your note sheet. The current yield is the annual coupon divided by the bond price. The current yield is the annual coupon divided by the bond price. It is not the same as yield and maturity. You might think, oh, they're just meaning the yield and maturity at present. No. Current yield means something different. If I said current yield and maturity, it would mean the yield and maturity at present. So, what, what, what is this? This is a very quick and dirty back of the envelope kind of, uh, of calculation. For discount bonds, this current yield is going to be lower than the yield of maturity because it's going to ignore the capital gain. In other words, the yield of maturity is telling us the gains that we're getting from coupons and from the capital gain or loss. And so since current yield is only concerned about the coupon, it's not telling us about that amazing capital gain we're going to get as that bond price climbs up to 1000 for premium bonds, this thing is going to be greater than the yield of maturity because it is ignoring the capital loss that we suffer over the life of the bond. For premium bonds, this current yield is going to be higher than yield of maturity simply because it ignores that capital loss. There will be one question at least, well, just let's say one question on the exam where I ask for current yield. If you are lucky, I will not give you enough information to calculate yield to maturity, which will hopefully shock you into remembering that current yield is not the same thing. If you are unlucky, I will give you enough information to calculate both. Do you think the yield of maturity would be among the incorrect answers, Ms. Wabi? Yes, she says, and she is so right. Questions? Reading is almost as important as mathematics when it comes to doing well on a finance exam because you need to read to know what is being asked for. Uh, I had some folks last time that they missed the word accept or they missed the word not. And it led to the wrong, wrong outcome. Okay, now let's talk about interest rate risk. We talked about this a little bit in chapter 10. It's the risk that changing interest rates will change bond values. Remember, each one of those coupons and that face value, they're all really future cash flows out there. And so as this required rate of return changes, as interest rates change, so does that required rate of return, and so does the price of the bond. If interest rates go up, bond values go down. Interest rates go down, bond values go up. Now I'm going to teach you a fancy Latin phrase here, ceteris. Paribus. Ceteris paribus is just fancy talk for all else equal. All else equal. That's what ceteris paribus means. Okay, now what do we mean? All else equal, bonds with longer times to maturity are more sensitive to interest rate risk. What do we mean? If we've got uh, two bonds that are otherwise identical except for their time to maturity, that one that has longer time to maturity is going to be more sensitive. And here's why. Take a look at this, this interest rate here, or this required return which is being driven by interest rates. If this thing changes by a small amount and we're doing it on a bond that matures in one half of the year, it's not going to make that much of a difference. But if it changes in that same amount on a 30-year bond, it's going to make a lot more difference because it's to the 30th power. Does that make sense? So that's why uh, longer time to maturity are more sensitive to the changes. 
And then we also say bonds with smaller coupons are more sensitive to the changes. Keep in mind that the price of a bond is a combination of the present value of those coupons and the present value of the face value. If you don't have any coupons at all, all the value of that bond is in that last payment that is sitting out there at, say, 30 years. That's extraordinarily risky from an interest rate perspective. But what if you had glorious fat coupons early on? You'd be getting a nice chunk of money after six months. It's only hanging out there six months. And so this T would be 0 0.5. And then your next chunk would be at one year. And it would be to the first power. And so you'd be getting more of the value of the bond earlier in the bond's life. Therefore, that present value isn't going to be as impacted by changes in interest rates. The bond with the absolute most interest rate risk would be a zero coupon bond with a really long time to maturity. The bond with the greatest coupon, or sorry, the bond with the greatest interest rate risk would be the one that's a zero coupon bond with a really long time to maturity because you can't get skinnier than zero on the coupons and you've got a really long time to maturity. So if you want to write that on your note sheet, that's probably smart. The, the absolute worst, uh, most interest rate risk you have is from um, long-term zero coupon bond. Questions? Now let's take a look at two otherwise identical bonds. One of them is a 30-year bond. The other one is a one-year bond. And uh, they are both uh, selling for $1,000 and the, by the way, that bottom shouldn't say interest rate, it should say yield to maturity. It should say yield to maturity. Now, how do I know what the coupon rate is for this bond? What do bonds sell for when the coupon rate is identical to the yield to maturity? They sell for par value. If this thing selling at par value when yield to maturity is 10%, what must the coupon rate be? Yeah, it's got to be. Now, down below they say 10% coupon bond, but we don't have to know that because we can figure it out for ourselves. Okay, now, my friend and I buy these bonds. I buy the one-year bond, and my friend buys the 30-year bond. And the yield maturity drops from 10 years to five years, or sorry, 10% to 5%. What happens to the price of both bonds? They both go up. Remember when yield and maturity falls, bond prices go up. And so I'm looking at my bond and I'm like, wow, that's nice. My bond just went up by 4.762%. I'm feeling pretty good until my friend calls. And my friend's like, hey, you see what happened to interest rates today? I'm like, yeah. He says, how's your bond doing? I said, yeah, I'm up 4.76%. To which my friend says, schmuck. I'm like, what do you mean? He says, I'm up 76.862%. Why is his bond up so much more than mine? Uh, yeah, it's the time to maturity, remember? that the greater the time to maturity, the greater the interest rate risk. Well, folks, this risk goes both ways. There's the bad risk when interest rates go up, but then there's the fun, happy time, candy, good risk when, t when interest rates go down. And so he's really enjoying things. Gives me a hard time. Reminds me every time I see him. And then interest rates start to go up. Eventually, uh, our yield of maturity is at 20%. And I'm feeling a little down because I am down, what, 83.33% or 8.33%? And so I call my friend because, you know, I need a shoulder to cry on. And I'm like, hey, dude, my mom's down 8.33%. And then my friend breaks into tears, right? Mm -hmm. And says, mine's down almost 50%. Why is his down so much more than mine? The same reason it was up so much more than mine. That long-term bond has a greater sensitivity to interest rate risk. 
So one time I was invited to talk to uh, the 12 or 12 or 24, I forget, best clients of uh, a trust company here in town. By the way, what's a trust company? Do poor people put money in trust companies? No, rich people do. Um, and so the 24 best clients were the 24 yes. richest. And so I walk into this old room, and these are all old, old Springfield type folks, bunch of old white dudes. They're sitting around the table. And I ask this question. I say, how many of you have recently bought a 30-year U.S. Treasury bond? Almost everybody's hand goes up. I said, okay, how many of you think that is a safe investment? Everybody's hand goes up. I said, okay, I just looked it up. The last time they sold treasury bonds, 30 year, the coupon rate was 3.875%. Does that sound right to you? And they were like, yeah, that's about right. Okay, then I told them, there's only one thing we know with certainty in finance, and that is that interest rates are mean reverting. What does mean reverting mean? Over time they go back to yeah, the average, right? Over time, they go back to the average. And I said, okay, let's look at the average interest rate for 30-year U.S. Treasury bonds over all time. And it turned out it was like 7%. I said, let's look at what would happen if, the, if interest rates rose, if that yield to maturity rose to 7%. And I showed them a the slide, and the slide showed like a 47% drop in the value of the bonds. And there were a few people around the table that I thought were going to have heart attacks because I just you know, like tore back the curtains on this whole treasury bonds are safe thing. Do you think they ever asked me back to talk to their 24 most valuable clients? Absolutely not. Questions? So keep in mind it's not just you guys that I'm cruel to. It's also old men. So let's use an example here of a real situation. General Motors, back in 1995, issued a 100-year bond. Now, I can only think of two reasons to issue a 100-year bond. If you think interest rates are getting ready to go up, or if you realize that your company is sick and people are going to figure it out and start requiring more to loan you money. So you want to lock in that nice low yield or that nice low interest rate for the life of this bond, which is 100 years. By the way, everyone that came up with this whole let's issue a 100-year bond, they're going to be dead by the time this thing matures, right? So they, they don't have to worry about you know when the time comes. The company might, even, might not even be there. So back to the story. It has a coupon rate of 7%, and it priced on December 31st, 1995, as $1,000. Can anyone tell me what the yield of maturity for that bond was on December 31st, 1995? 7%. 7%. How'd you know? Yeah, it's selling at a par value, right? Okay. Now, interest rates start to go up, and I remember this because about this time, I was getting a mortgage for our first house and our mortgage was 8% and we were thrilled to get it. We were thrilled to get it. By the way, interest rates today for a mortgage 6.75%, still below normal times. Okay, back to the story. Interest rates are going up, so what does that do to bond prices? Pushes them down. This thing is extraordinarily sensitive to interest rate risk because time, right? It's out there to the hundredth power, that face value. Okay, so it drops 20% of its value. And then, by uh, 2007, it's up to, oh, by the way, uh, yield to maturity, 1996, we know it had to be above 7% because this is now a discount bond. Now, move forward to uh, September 26, 2007, and we see that the bond is selling now for 1,020. What's the yield to maturity? Is it more or less than 7%? It's got to be less than this thing selling at a premium. And so there was another swing in value there of 27.5%. Now, I'm going to ask you a question about where you think this bond is today. What do you think this bond's worth today? After all, it's a 100-year bond. It matures 2095. What's it worth today?
Just take a guess. I want to say that it's probably being sold at a premium since you said that the interest rates were lower than seven. Currently. Okay, that would make sense if the bond were still around. What happened to General Motors? They went bankrupt. What do you think would happen to the people who own this bond? Right? <laughs> These bonds are worthless. Questions? So as a bond holder, if you believe interest rates are going to increase, you should buy a bond at a lower yield. Yeah. So if you think uh, interest rates are going up, wait to buy your bond. Does that make sense? If you think they're going down, jump in right now. Here's the problem. Does anybody for sure know what's going to happen? No. Jerome Powell, do you know who that is? The head of the Federal Reserve, right? He probably has an idea. But I can tell you this, central banks, uh, what, they, what they want to do and what they manage to accomplish are not always exactly the same thing. And so sometimes they're going to push the accelerator, the car will slow down. Sometimes they hit the brakes and they're like, ah, right? Because it still keeps speeding up. So Jerome Powell probably has a better guess than the rest of us, but not really. Uh, the only thing, like I said, I, I, so back when interest rates were so low, I'm like, you know, uh, don't buy bonds because interest rates are going to go mean reverting, right? They're going to go higher. You're going to lose money. And what happened? Interest rates went even lower and made me look like a total idiot, right? I had the math right. I didn't have the timing right. Am I right now? Absolutely, right? Eventually, interest rates did go back up. Of course, it took me 10 years to become right. Questions? OK, let's see. Yeah, so we've only got one slide left to go, and it has nothing to do with calculations. So go ahead and do your homework. OK, so last time we left off, we had one slide left. By the way, we had just got through talking about interest rate risk. Can someone tell me the two things that make a bond sensitive to interest rate risk? Two things that make a bond sensitive to interest rate risk. Time uh -huh. and coupons. Okay, very good. Let's talk about, is it the long time or the short time that makes them sensitive? Long. Yeah, it's the long time because these little changes in rates are going to get magnified by a bigger T. And so that's going to make this thing more <coughs> susceptible to interest rate changes as the time goes out. Now, tell me about these coupons. If you want a bond to be interest rate risky, would you have skinny coupons or fat coupons? If you want it to be risky, you want the skinny coupons, right? right? So if you thought interest rates were going to go up, you go out and you buy yourself a bunch of skinny coupon bonds. By the way, what's the skinniest coupon coupon you can think of? Zero, right? Okay. So uh, now, <clears throat> so those are the two things that we said make bonds riskier from an interest rate perspective, or another word we have for that is price risk. But now let's talk about another kind of risk. <clears throat> it's called reinvestment risk. And that's the risk that these future cash flows that you get, by the way, future cash flows would be the coupons and the future value, the face value, that those will be, you won't be able to reinvest them at the same interest rate, that you have to go lower. By the way, just like re, uh, interest rate risk, this risk goes both ways, because what if you're getting your coupons and then you're able to reinvest them at a higher rate? So this one cuts both ways also. Now, it's the bond interest rate, sorry, bond reinvestment risk is just the opposite. The things that make bonds sensitive to this are just the opposite. So, for instance, <clears throat> if I have a short term bond, so let's assume this. Well, let's say instead of buying a 30 year bond, I'm going to buy 31 year bonds. How often do I have to reinvest that principal? once per year, right? With the other one, we only have to invest, reinvest once per 30 years. So short time to maturity increases reinvestment risk. Short time to maturity increases reinvestment risk. 
And then we also have larger coupons, which is the opposite of interest rate risk. Larger coupons lead to greater risk. And here's why. After six months, I'm going to get this big old chunky coupon. What do I need to do with it? Assuming that you're not just spending these coupons on stuff, right? You're going to reinvest it. And if you've got to, so that means once every six months that you've got this opportunity to reinvest at a lower rate. And so this is reinvestment risk. If you structure your portfolio to avoid interest rate or price risk, then you are giving yourself a world full of reinvestment risk. And if you structure your portfolio to avoid reinvestment risk, you are giving yourself a world full of price risk or interest rate risk. So there is nowhere to run to. Pick your poison. Which one would you rather have? Questions?